Hello and welcome to the quarterfinals of Pro Tour Journey into Knicks. I'm Brian David Marshall, joined by Randy Bueller. There is only one seat left in the semifinals, and these two players are going to have to kill each other <laughs> in order for one of them to get there. Reed Duke versus Yuki Ichikawa, and they are ready to go. Reed Duke has Mulligan to six yes. for his opening hand. Uh, his hand's pretty solid, though. Okay, tell, tell us what his deck is and tell us what he's facing. So he's playing Bug Control. Uh, Pantheon, most of them played this. We already saw Jamie Park make the semifinals with essential, uh, sorry, lose to Pat Chapin with this deck. Uh, we saw Raptor make the semifinals with a similar version, although that was the other Channel Fireball team. They didn't work together. The lists are like half a dozen cards off. So you've seen similar decks. Yuki Ichikawa, on the other side, is playing Red Green Elspeth. So this is very similar. It's the same basic strategy as the one Mengucci was just using in the previous quarterfinal. Is Ichikawa also playing the uh, Xenagos? His Xenagoses are in the sideboard. Okay. He's, he's got one main and then the rest on the side. Exactly. He does have a Johnny, Mentor of Heroes, in his in his version of the deck, Ooh. though, which is, was not a card that Mengucci was running. And there's one in his hand, too. No, no creatures to actually pile <laughs> counters on top of, though. Uh, yeah, we've got to get our names updated on the card push tool. That's obviously not Nam. That's Mengucci, or it's uh, Ichikawa. You see the name cues wrong. So Reed, Reed, Reed Dukes opened Nam. up with Sylvan Carry added into Corsair of Crufix. This is the preferred opening for this uh, seven of eight yeah. Pro Tour Top 8 competitors like this opening. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, plays land, leaves the read the bones on top of his deck. So the big difference between this and like maybe the Josh Hunter Layton bug de bug deck is that uh, they're they're playing a few more lands in this deck, right? I, I yeah, it's fully two different, which was surprising to me. Uh, CFB Prime went with 24 lands. Pantheon is at 26, and apparently Gabriel Nassif was saying maybe even a 27th. Um, Andrew Cuneo is the 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 guy that is, gets the most credit for this list when you talk to the Pantheon guys. Uh, Cuneo has been designing control decks basically since the beginning of time. <laughs> I certainly, you know, the, the deck that some people call Bueller Blue, I would always call Cuneo Blue. Yes. You know, I, that's that's who built it first, and then I just t tweaked it a little bit. So, yeah, Andrew Cuneo put up a nice finish here, too. You know, another top 32 for him, I think 20-something. Top, top 25. Top 25. He top qualified 25. for the next Pro Tour. Uh, okay, Pelucranos comes down. It's a big man. Big green monster. You know, Ichikawa does have... He's got a second Banishing Light. Yeah. He's got some Elspeths, too, although he can't wait for that. Yeah, two, Elsp two Elspeths and an Ajani. All Planeswalkers all the time, evidently. Reed is kind of sort of running out of gas, but he does have Reed the Bones in his hand, which is another difference um, in his deck versus uh, Raptor's deck. The Pantheon version is a little better at drawing some extra cards with Read the Bones. The Black Which, Divination. Yeah. Yeah, it seems quite good. I mean, there aren't many decks, well, certainly at this point in the tournament. The aggro decks, there were aggro decks on day one who would pressure your life total early. Pushes um, but, both cards. Yeah. Corsair and Karyatid are so good at blocking versus the aggro decks. And we saw that when uh, Josh Edder Leighton beat Sifka in the first quarterfinal. That, yeah, you can sit on high life and, you know, you wind up in these just mid-game attrition fights with the other three-color good stuff decks. Being able to draw those extra cards, and it's almost like drawing four cards because you hit the point in the game where you don't really want the lands anyway. So we're going to see a Johnny come down. He's going to look at the top uh, of his library, look for a creature or an enchantment or a planeswalker or an aura, right? Johnny is a good card. Doesn't die to silence the believers either. Takes Corsair of Crufix out of uh, those cards. Still lots of Planeswalker action in his hand. Yeah, his hand seems loaded. But there is the dreaded Prognostic Sphinx for Hello. Reed Duke. That is the signature card for the bug control list. And I, I think a card you're going to expect to see a lot of in the coming year in Standard as well. Well, we'll have to see what the Wrath of God situation is like. I mean, I think the reason you're not seeing it in Standard is the presence of Supreme Verdict. Um, Hexproof, discarding a card for Hexproof doesn't do anything versus a Supreme Verdict. Okay, like so you say, though, I mean, Block Constructed really often is. This is where Standard decks are born. 
So Elspeth makes three tokens. Is a Johnny gonna make them big? <laughs> Looks like he's reaching for more dice. Puts two counters on one token, one counter on the other. Four cards. You gonna see someone gain a hundred life in this quarterfinal? Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't seem like the life totals are the most relevant thing going on to me. Not gonna lie. Agnostic Sphinx's job is to chip away at Planeswalkers, but there's 11 loyalty worth of Planeswalkers on Ichikawa's side of the board right now. And there's, what, six power worth of attackers that can be nine power worth of attackers. That said, the Scry probably right. pushes it over right. the top. Right, that's it. Re Reduke Scry's three. I mean, you yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, eh. Kind of disappointed not to have this guy available to block, but he needs to find answers. He needs to find multiple answers. Oh, he drew a Bile Blade that I, on a recent turn. Maybe drew that off the Read the Bones? Right. I, That's I a good so. one. Interesting. Ichikawa did not make a four toughness soldier token. This 2 1 split may hurt him when this. Uh, I think we're going to see another Read the Bones happens. here. Uh, Reed, Reed compared it to like, or I mean, maybe it was Owen who compared it to, to drawing four. The idea that you just mm -hmm. get to see so good, far down deep into your library with that card. Yeah, he did push, push. So looking to see, does uh, there is one unravel the ether in uh, Reed's deck if he wants to. Uh, let his Pollock Polychronos loose. So curious how each cow will sequence his planeswalker right. activations here. Right. Yeah, if he Elf if he activates Elspeth before a Johnny, that Bile Blight is gonna sting. <laughs> but he wisely goes for a Johnny first. Wow, two plus one. They're all 3-3s. Three I mean, he wants to be able to beat up the Karyatid. I think that's why he cares about 3-3. Three three, but it does mean that uh, by this Bile Blight is quite good. Uh, he's at least going to force Reed to use it before he activates Elspeth. Okay. I just want to point out that we are very, very close to seeing someone gain 100 life here. I, I disagree. <laughs> We are not remotely <laughs> close to seeing someone gain 100 life. Elspeth refresh and replenishes the, uh, the ranks there. And of course, if Krifix goes down, we get to see a little more information about each cow's deck as we see the top. There's Apollo's Crusher. Duke is holding two Silence of Believers, would gladly shuffle both of them back for a hero's downfall. Indeed. Game up. Big one. 17, 20. Yeah. Go. Nope. Feels like Reed's been getting ahead, getting ahead, and yet somehow he's way behind. The opponent's got more gas in his hand. I guess it's just the fact that the silence of believers aren't particularly relevant to this board state. Attack. Destroy. So. Prognoska Sphinx gets the job it was assigned to do done. It kills an Elspeth. Yep. But there is still the matter of an Ajani to deal with. I mean, the, the prognostic sphinx gets gets out of hand very quickly when you when you're scrying three. You know, we've talked to players. We did an Esper deck tech with Shaheen Sarani, and he said, "Bottom, bottom, bottom." I've practically stacked my entire deck in some games mm -hmm. just through you know virtue of fourteen scry lands and you know multiple prognostic sphinx activations. He's like, "I know what my whole deck was in order." 
Yeah, we saw a game, LSV play a game in the feature match area where he set up the last two cards of his library to be the turn he went for it in a like three Sphinx versus three Sphinx stare down. Of course, his opponent top decked to break it up. But sure. What are you going to do? It was still, you know, he'd scried cards to the bottom and then knew they were there so that he could sort of, he started playing for that turn with like 15 turns to go or so. Crazy. Johnny's at eight. It's one counter on Corsair of Crufix. Two counters on an on a Elspeth Soldier token. And comes in with everybody. Now Reed does have seven for silence here. Seems like you do it, right? Silence, yeah, pay the strive cost once, kill the two creatures that have tokens on them. That's what's gonna happen. Yep. Uh, yep. Reed Take one. steadily taking control. I mean, Ichikawa had the two Planeswalkers going. But Reed is just whittling away. I mean, this is a prognostic Sphinx game, right? I mean, Reed just keeps finding answers, keeps finding gas. Gets ahead a little bit with Reed the Bones. He's just had so many scries that... But Elspeth number two comes down. Tokens three through five come down. Had Reed planted on top? Was it another side? Oh, no, he, he had pushed all three, right? Did he push, push? Oh, yeah, he did. He pushed yeah. three last turn. I, I think he just uh, pulled a land here. No, I think it was the oh. second Silence the Believers. Oh. A.K.A. a third Silence the Believers? Sure. Pushes a card. Attacks a Johnny. Uh, attacks Elspeth. Scries. Is that a psychic intrusion on top? That is one of the choices. It's funny, Ichikawa has been sitting on those two banishing lights for quite some time. They aren't all that good against Reed's deck. Right, not 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 a whole mess of creatures, and a lot of them have or can acquire hexproof. I mean, you can get a coarser. Get Kiara, but not a ton of targets. So each cow activates the search ability, the second ability on a Johnny, which goes up to nine. Look at the top four cards of your library. I wonder how many times you have to ultimate a Johnny to deck Reed Deuce. <laughs> I mean, the 100 life's not going to change the board state very much in this matchup. Maybe it's just decking The 100 life is play. a lot of life. It's a lot of coarser. It's a lot. Of, I'm sorry. A lot of prognostic Sphinx attacks. <laughs> I don't think Reed has 34 cards left in his library, right? Tax with five tokens, seven carry added blocks one, three more come down. Yeah, Reed needs to, he's only got the one Bile Blight in his main deck, so he's not going to be able to come up with a Bile Blight to sweep all those guys away. <laughs> I'm hearing uh, news from the, uh, the you know, the uh, back room here. There's as much as they would not like to see the game go that long, they would indeed like to see someone <laughs> gain 100 life. <laughs> He's got another Johnny in his hand. We could see it. Uh, I mean, the real issue in this game is, is the soldier tokens. Reed already used his Bio Blight. He's, I mean, a Johnny basically forced him to. The second Elspeth, I mean, Reed can kill it with his Prognostic Sphinx. But yeah, he, uh, he's got to, he's losing control of the board. Right. Silence of Believers takes care of the uh, Polish Crusher. And a Corsair of Crufix. Yeah, yeah, that play seems pretty straightforward. And I mean, I think you have to kill Elspeth here. Like, like what is it? Eight soldier tokens now? And Reed is on ten. How many cards? 
the thing is, even if he comes up with blockers, like, yeah, but, I mean, Corsair is the obvious good blocker for those soldier tokens. But there's Banishing Light, Banishing Light in, in Ichikawa's hand. Precisely. I'm going to do a lap around this booth if he gains 100 life. I'm just telling you right okay. now. I'll get out of your way. <laughs> I'll go up and over you. I don't care. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to get in your way. <laughs> Duke. And agonizing over his scries. Once again, pushes all three cards. Sounds like he's going to have a lot of uh, opportunities for sideboard. I mean, if he's got this many <laughs> cards, he wants to push. And another prognostic sphinx, perhaps? Or is this going to be psychic intrusion? Psychic intrusion. What you got? You know who could gain 100 life and use it? <laughs> is Reed. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to have time for that, but still amusing. Only that was a detention sphere instead of a banishing light. Oh that would gosh. get him out of this. Still might be worse. You take banishing light, you can get the Yajani. Does that make sense here? Doesn't deal with eight soldiers, but... Is going to take a banishing light. Can he afford to play it? <laughs> Tapping mana confluence is Nine. less than ideal here. He's got to deal with a Johnny. Yep, takes the Johnny out. But I think we're going to see banishing light on banishing light here. He can. And then even if something happened to his banishing light, the banishing light that came back would be his banishing light. <laughs> <laughs> and Wow. Is that, wait, does plus three win this game right here? Did he just decline a lethal attack? I, I think so. He had a lethal attack if he just distributes three plus one plus one counters. And Reed's tapped out. I mean, I don't know how Reed gets out of it anyway. But I think he just declined a lethal attack. Uh, he just plays the oh. other. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. There you go. He just went a little more camera time. And with it, you know, he wants to still have all these. Is that what's going on? Hiya. Ever polite. Good game from Reed Duke. True. Oh, and a, a smile. Sees a drown in sorrow on top of his deck. Oh, that's what he was digging for. That's what he was digging for, of course. Drown in sorrow. Wow, okay. Wow. Let's dig into sideboards here, Randy. Yuki Ichikawa, what is he going to do? I mean, it looked pretty good game one. Is, he, is there anything he's going to want to change here? I got to say, though. Okay, fine. Uh, Ichikawa sideboard. I, I mean, the Xenagos just seems solid. You know, he can overwhelm Reed's ability to chip away at Planeswalkers. Reed's basically just attacking with Prognostic Sphinx. Um, so I think the Xenagoses are solid. I mean, obviously not Magnus Bray. Hunt the Hunter doesn't do anything. I don't think Hammer works particularly well in this match. I mean, it's okay. If it goes late, you know, being able to make three threes is is not nothing. But I, mean, I, I think the Xenagoses are the card that excites me the most here. Uh, the card I think I've seen Ichikawa sideboard the most often mm -hmm. is actually the Perforos God of the Forge. Okay. Uh, you know, pretty... Uh, Pretty fast clock when combined with Elspeth. Sure, sure. You know, each Elspeth activation with that play is six damage. That's exciting. And that's also damage you can redirect to a uh, another planeswalker. Perhaps. That makes sense. So uh, I, I've seen I've seen him using that card a lot in, in uh, control matchups this weekend. So I'm curious if he'll bring that in. But uh, I, I feel like Reed is probably going to do a little bit of major surgery here, just based on how many cards he was pushing. No, look, look. Or he was just digging for the, the Drown and Sorrow. Uh, yeah, I, I should have been setting it up. Obviously, he's digging for Drown and Sorrow. With a key card that actually distinguishes the Pantheon version of this, and we can actually flip to Reed's sideboard because there's another one there. We can talk about it. Um, that Drown and Sorrow, there's three in the main. There's the fourth one in the board. If Reed just finds a single copy of Drown and Sorrow, like he went through the one Bile Blight, there's three Drown and Sorrows, and that's what he was digging for. One okay. Drown and Sorrow 
kills all of those tokens, and then all and then Reed, it felt like he had the prognostic things. He kept drawing good cards, but I mean he looked at four cards a turn for how many turns? I mean he killed two Elspeths. <laughs> Right? That's at least That's at least 16. four attack steps, yeah. Right? It feels like there was maybe another one. I think he looked at at least 16 cards. And, you know, not to mention the 10 cards he'd drawn before that. But basically, the top half of Reed's library, when he shuffled for that right. game, had zero copies of Drown and Sorrow. And so, you know, just the random Elspeth tokens that were left over got him. Kind of, kind of a bad beat. You know, sure. that good game from Reed, he... I'm not convinced I'm the same species at Reed Duke. Like, not just fending off the tilt of failing to draw a Drown and Sorrow there, but to say good game? Like, I mean, it was kind of an interesting game, but the game is only interesting because Reed got horribly unlucky. I, I laugh because I've drafted with you. <laughs> Uh, so, so what do you, what do you think? Obviously, you think the fourth Drown and Sorrow is coming in. I mean, it's, what it's do you think is happening? It's not spectacular in this matchup. Sure. It only cleans up leftover Elspeth tokens. I mean, you do what you got to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Ashiok might actually be decent here. There's so many creatures in Ichikawa's deck um, that Ashiok being able to steal Stormbreath Dragons and whatnot is actually not bad. Unravel Ether seems like a fine card to me when your you know opponent has a lot of uh, banishing lights and such. Yeah, Unravel seems very good. Um, Ichikawa does have a lot of dead cards in his deck too. The other thing that didn't happen there, Ichikawa's got four Chain to the Rocks in his deck that don't do basically anything against Reed. Right, they basically. You know, that's get a, why you know basically get a coarser. Yeah, that and, which is all the banishing lights do really. Yeah. <laughs> so. You know, Ichikawa probably improves after sideburning. I, and I saw Reed say that this morning. He was saying, I really hope I get game one because things get worse after sideboarding. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, no, his game one is just better. And he was on the play in game one and just could not find that Drown and Sorrow. Man, I didn't even... Yeah, he was digging with a mission and it was the right mission and it should by rights have worked out. You want another good guy Reed Duke story? So I show up this morning and I see and he's sitting next to Jamie Park. Right, and Jamie, and you know, I'm asking Jamie how it's going because Jamie's got the matchup against Pat Chapin, and the three of them are all teammates. They're all part of Pantheon. And Jamie is saying, well, you know, I haven't tested the match as much as Pat. You know, Chapin had so many reps with his deck, and everybody on Pantheon wanted to just keep testing the bug control deck. So Pat had sort of accidentally play tested a bunch coming into the event against exactly Jamie Park's deck. And, you know, Jamie is like, you know, I, I haven't gotten the opportunity to play that much. And Reed Duke turns over next to him and he's like, you know, are, are people coming to play with you? Because, you know, I, I can play that matchup for you if you need me. <laughs> He is. He's got his own top eight match to play for, and he's volunteering to help his teammate out. <laughs> he's, he, <laughs> Just in case nobody is coming to Jamie's. I mean, Jamie was fine. He had John and yeah, Kai coming yes. in to play test with him. Um, but yeah, no, Reed was totally serious. You, you want to play? The biggest sweetheart on the Pro Tour. There you see the players looking at their opening seven. Reed Duke on the play again. Thinking. He has not announced whether he's going to keep a mulligan yet. And he says, I'll oh, draw three more geez. cards. Nope, he's at, he's going to mulligan. Reed is going to be in the lead in the player of the year race, whether he wins or loses right. this match. The 20 points that he got from making the top eight is already enough to give him a four-point lead on Jeremy Dezani, uh coming down the home stretch. I think, I mean, I know Reed is at the GP cap. I think Dazani is there as well. Oh, yes, absolutely. Dazani can top eight they a can GP still... and get one point. Does Reed have five top eights? Uh, I, 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 I have to I, check I feel like they're pretty similar where, like, if the, they do go to a GP, then maybe they get a point. But right. it's the, not going to be decided the fifth, in GPs. The fifth result for uh, Dazani is a top eight in teams. <laughs> okay. So he's got four top eights. And then, uh, I think uh, Reed's might be a top 16. They might be almost in exactly the same situation with GPs, which means it's not the place for them to chase points. No, no, no. You know, it's going to come down to players are going to get points there. Yeah, I think, I think both of them can get one point with a top eight and a GP. Yeah. I mean, winning it could get you, you know, three or four or five, sure. but you certainly can't play just to win. Um, so the player of the year race is going to come down to Portland. Reed's going to come in with a lead. His lead is currently four. Obviously, he's got more potential to pick up points here, though he's down a game in mulliganing. Um, nobody is, else is particularly close. Um, Sifka was capable of getting within, you know, single digits. Wow. But he lost. So I think Josh Utter Layton is now the guy who can close the most ground, but I'm not even sure he can get within 10 points. So it's really going to be the two of them and then a sizable gap in the player of the year race going into 
going into Pro Tour Poland. I mean, if, if somebody like Sifka or Raptor or, you know, Owen Turtenwald is still going to be in the top five, you know, if one of those guys wins Portland, okay, fair enough. But nobody else is going to be even close to those guys without a top eight. Ray Duke studying his six card hand. It, no, he, he's not going to take it. If he's if he's going to force a game three, he's going to do it with five cards. Jeez. Ray Duke is going to five. You see Ichikawa. Now, you, that sweat where you're like, oh, you know, <laughs> you, know you, you begin reevaluating your hand. <laughs> As your opponent, well, you're like, oh, did, you know, I don't know if I can beat a five card hand. <laughs> you know, players always have nightmare stories about well, playing against people who've mulliganed to two, mulliganed to four. Yeah, I think I have Ichikawa's hand, by the way. It's uh, it's not good. He kept five land carry added voyaging Seder. Wow. It's just all mana, no gas. So he's depending on the top of his library. Now, to be fair, two of the lands are uh, scry lands, but three right. of them aren't. I mean, that does mean he'll hit carry at it on turn two. If he needs to. Well, I mean, <laughs> he'll he'll want to. Like, you go turn one temple, turn two carry at it, and then turn three, you can play a temple or an untapped land, depending on what you've come up with. Like, you want the acceleration. Anyway, yeah, Ichikawa's draw is flawed. It, it, it can definitely lose to a five-card draw from Reed if, he, if Ichikawa doesn't have gas near the top of his library, then his draw doesn't actually do anything. He looks at five, I see lands. Okay. We are ready to go here in game two of the quarterfinals between Reed Duke and Yuki Ichikawa. Here at Pro Tour Journey into Knicks, and Reed Duke, who's mulligan to five, leads off with a swamp. Scryland from Yuki Chikawa. There you see that hand that Randy alluded to before. Lots of lands. Oh, and then it goes to Reveler. That was his first draw. That oh, counts. No second land for Reed Duke. Good. Really? Here comes the here comes the carry added. Okay. There's a Scryland. Then it goes to Reed Peaks. To Zenigos is going to get to throw Seder in the in the way immediately, though. Well, yes, he, he is. He tops it. it. Probably means it's land. Yeah, he's keeping he's keeping his card. Untapped land. Zenigos the Reveler. Here comes the Seder. Get in for two. Good. What is it for Reed? Reed, we know it was a, a land because he kept it on top of his deck. He scries again. What does he have in his hand? We can see that he's holding Ashiok Nightmare Weaver, a Prognostic Sphinx, the unra an Unraveled Ether, and a pair of Heroes Downfalls. Oh, a Johnny Mentor. Lean forward. A Johnny Mentor of Heroes just joined uh, his the cards in his hand. He's got an untapped land for it. Instead, just makes a Seder. Gets in for four. Plays a Scryland. Pushes it there. You see He's also hand. got Pelucranos. Oh, and he chooses to play Pelucranos <laughs> instead. Four cards. And that was, so next turn, he can play a Johnny. Four cards in hand. Reed confirms. I, I'm not sure there was any draw Reed was winning with this draw from Ichikawa. The top of his deck has just delivered up nothing but platinum hits. <laughs> no pun intended. They may be platinum hits yes, by the end of the weekend well for Ichikawa. Platinum, yes. Reed Duke shuffles through his cards. His He's got Hero's Downfall. He's got it twice, but he's still going to deal with the Planeswalker and the Pelucranos. Which one do you kill first? If you're going to find a way out of this. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess Pelucranos, but 
it's hard to imagine Reed getting out of this. So I get, hey, the way you get out of this from this board, you kill Pelucranos, you kill Xenagos, you drown in sorrow. He drew Stormbreath Dragon. <laughs> Stormbreath Dragon Seriously? off the top for Yuki Ichikawa. He's pressing his advantage. He started off with just seven mana sources yes. in his hand. And he's attacking for infinity damage here. That's six, that's 10, that's 15. Reed has a hero's downfall to stay alive. Yeah. But there, he's, there's no outs. There is no supreme verdict in this format for right. him. Stormbreath Dragon goes down. He takes 11. Reed dukes on three. Play a Skyland. Push it. Reed Duke draws his card. Do you have an answer? He extends the hand. Yuki Ichikawa is through to the semifinals. Takes his quarterfinal match in two, you know, two really quick games where, where Reed's Duke, Reed Duke's deck did Reed's not Duke. Uh, deliver on the promise that it made throughout the Swiss for him. Yeah, his deck let him down. I mean, he still got a smile on his face, but uh, it's it's got a little grimace behind it. He His deck let him down. I mean, game two, he had to mulligan to five. Game one... All he needed was a Drown and Sorrow to yeah. clean up the Elspeth tokens. He dealt with both the Elspeths. Yes. He killed two Elspeths. He, he killed the Najani. He was on his heels the entire game. Yeah, but he was he had everything. If he just he just needed to find a Drown and Sorrow to sweep the board, and I mean then at least he'd be playing a game three right, right. now. Well, you know, Didn't work. first of what I think most people assume will be many top eights for Reed Duke. I agree. An amazing weekend for him. Yeah, I agree. Completely. You know, I you watch him there, he clearly knows. Everything there is to know about magic at this point. I mean, if he continues to put in the work that he's been putting in, you know, his reign at the top of the player of the year race is going to last quite some time. Right. And uh, Yuki Hichikawa, you know, someone playing in his third pro tour. I mean, mm -hmm. worth noting, you know, in a very similar situation to Reed Duke. So this is a player who plays a lot of magic online. He's, sure. a, you know, a popular streamer, has done well at a couple of Grand Prix. He's, you know, he's got that sort of early resume. And then he surrounds himself. Who did you prepare for this tournament with? If you look at his profile, oh, you know, Yu Yu Watanabe, uh, Makahito Mihara, Kenji Samura, Kentaro Yamamoto, and Junya Iyanaga. Not bad. Right? So that's like the Japanese pantheon. Sure. You know, I mean, that, that is, that's, you know, the same kind of situation that, you know, Reed Duke has been in for the last couple of years. So, you know, we could be seeing a lot more of Ichikawa. True. Uh, you know, for the rest of the season. Unbelievable. So that sets up some, some great semifinals. We're going to send it back to the news desk and let Rich Hagon tell you all about what we're going to see down the stretch here on day three at Pro Tour Journey into Knicks. Eh, going to have to settle for Marshall Cyclops on this one. There's Zach Hill, Marshall Cyclops. No Rich Hagan. He is out getting more content ready for you. I want to take a quick look here at our semifinals, how we got here, right? So we are now fully through the quarters. Four players have been eliminated. Four players remain. There's only going to be one champion. Why don't we take a look at our quarterfinal bracket to see who we have coming up in the next two semifinal matches. Zach, why don't you walk us through what happened here in our first match? Well, the first match we saw Josh utter Layton up against Stanislav Sivka. Sivka, his second Pro Tour top eight, and really the only truly aggressive deck in this top eight, also the only deck without the one-two punch of Sylvan Karyatid and uh, Corsair of Crufix. We saw Josh defeating Sivka in three games after a pretty tight match. All right, and in the next one, we had Patrick Chapin versus Jamie Park, first seed versus eight seed here. We had first seed versus eight seed, Pat Chapin playing a really innovative, which I guess is appropriate, I like that. junk mid-range deck designed to prey upon decks like the one that Park's playing. Park with the Channel Fireball Pantheon list of blue, black, green control. Pat Chapin defeating Jamie Park again in a long match in three games. That brought us to our third quarterfinal match, which is Andrea Mangucci versus Namsung Wook. Andrea Mangucci versus Nam again went to three games. Mangucci on the red green Elspeth deck. Nam Sun Wook on a junk deck, uh, junk constellation, but without some of the cards like Doomwake Giant that we've seen in other lists. Mangucci got game one on the back of some powerful enchantment removal spells, but Nam with a sort of transformative, resilient mid range creature package, able to take games two and three. Nam advances to the semis. That brought us to the one that you just watched on camera. Number two, seated in the tournament, 
and in the world Reed Duke against Yuchi Ichikawa. And Reed Duke, one of the hottest players alive right now, a fan favorite. Reed coming in with the bug control deck that we were talking about. Yuki Ichikawa on the red green deck with Elspeth, a list that sort of uh, looks like a lot of lists people had about two or three weeks ago with four copies of Chain to the Rocks, but really innovative technology in terms of Porphyros God of the Forge out of the sideboard, one of the most important cards in the matchup. Four cards were the uh, four copies of Polish Crusher, Polis Crusher, and two a Johnny Mentor of Heroes in the main deck. Great card for winning these kind of mid-range, mid-wage control fights. Yuki Ishikawa advances to the semifinals. So that's going to set the stage for our semifinals. We are going to have Patrick Chapin versus Josh Utter Layton. Also, Nam Soon Wook versus Yuki Ishikawa coming up for you shortly. But first, we've been talking about this. The players are on their lunch break right now. So we've got a little bit of time here to chat, but we wanted to kick things off with something very exciting, Zach the fall set. It's always exciting to know what's coming up, what the theme is. You worked on it. You don't know what the name is, yeah, though. Yeah, I, I genuinely, I, <laughs> I worked on this set. I worked on design. I, some of the cards probably have my uh, little fingerprints all over them, but I have no idea what the set is called. I have not seen this announcement. I'm probably as excited as you guys are to see what's coming next. Yeah, so Richard Hagen went to Renton to have a chat with Mark Rosewater to fill us in on this set. I, I think we're even going to see some of the artwork. We're going to get the name of it. Let's check it out right now. We're here inside R&D at Wizards of the Coast. Great pleasure to welcome on set Mark Rosewater, the head designer for Magic. Mark, what's the best bit about your job? Uh, the best bit of my job is making magic. The hard part about my job is that I have these secrets that I have to keep for years and years and not tell anybody the awesome things we're doing. So when I finally get to tell people, I'm very excited, like today. Excellent. What are you going to share with us? Okay, so take a look at this. Wow, there's a lot to take in on that picture. What exactly are we looking at there? That is the uh, first art from Cons of Tarkir, the fall 2014 set. Wow, okay, so Cons of Tarkir, Tarkir, not a name I recognize. Is this a brand new world for magic? Um, well, it is and it isn't. It's brand new in the sense that we've ne we, the players, have never been here before. But it's not brand new in that we've heard of it. It is the home world of this guy. Wow, he looks impressive. Who is that? That is Sarkin Vall. Okay, I remember him from like 2007, 2008, I guess. Okay, so the, those that know their history, let me explain a little bit for those that might not know their history. Right. So Sarkin Vall, here's what we know. We know he came from a, a war-torn world uh, ruled by warlords, and once upon a time, the, there was mighty dragons, but they were killed off. And that he came to worship the dragons, but on his world, they were all dead. Right. Which is why when he became a planeswalker and got to go to other worlds and for the first time see dragons, that he got so excited. Well, so, I, I can see how you would get excited seeing dragons for the first time. Um, you've seen plenty of dragons in your time as head designer, but every set has a lead design and also a lead developer. So yes. who's on the team this time around? Well, the lead designer for the set is, is myself. The lead developer is Eric Lauer. So if you enjoyed Innistrad or Theros, it's the same team that brought you those two sets. Um, <laughs> that's very much the heavy hitters of, of R&D. Um, every set has its, its sort of structure, its story arc. How is the block structure going to work for, uh, for this? Well, there's a lot that goes into it. I'm just going to explain the basics. So there's going to be a large, small, large set. But we have a very interesting thing we're doing with the whole... I mean, I'm not going to explain this today, but we're doing something very different, something we've never done before, uh -huh. um, but it's large, small, large. All right, so that's the basic idea. Large yeah. set. So we know that Khans of Tarkir is large. That's the first thing. A large fall set, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, when, then? What, what does fall mean? Uh, well, it's, it's going to come out September 26, 2014. And, uh, like I said, it is... Chock full of good stuff. Okay, so Khans of Tarkir, it's a new world, the home of Sark and Vol. Mark, lead designer. Eric Lau, lead developer. Large set, followed by small and large, but maybe with a twist, he says. 26th of September, 2014, is the big date you need to remember. Mark, while we've got you here, because we don't get near you enough, any other secrets you want to share? Okay, okay yes, yes, one thing. Well, two things, two things. Okay, first off, there's something that people have been asking us to do for quite a while that we're finally bringing back after a long absence in magic. And there's something that people have been asking us to do that we've never done that for the first time we're doing in Kinds of Tarkir. So you get something old, something new, put together in an awesome, awesome fall set. Great. What are those things? 
The full set for Magic the Gathering 2014 is Khans of Tarkir. Hey guys, welcome back to the news desk. A Randy Bueller appears. We've also got Zach Hillmarsh, the cyclist here. We've still got a few minutes here. Well, we've got about 15 to 20 <laughs> minutes here until we're actually back down in the feature match area for our first semifinal match. So we're going to take a little time to chat with these two gentlemen. You guys have been to many pro tours as both players and on the coverage team. And, uh, you know, when you're out and about, you note things about the format, about what's going on in the bigger picture on Magic, and there's a lot of takeaways that you guys will end up having over the course of a weekend. We decided to do a little segment about those takeaways. Zach, what was your first takeaway? Well, I mean, we can go ahead and take a look at it on the screen, but uh, my first takeaway has to do with some of the constructed decks that we've seen today. Uh, sometimes constructed can be limited. Uh, one of the things you've seen in this block constructed format uh, remarks over and over again about how a lot of decks looked like really, really good draft decks. We saw heroic decks based around aqueous form and uh, cards like Stratus Walk designed to get over cards like Corsair of Crufix and Sylvan Karyatid. I talked to Stanislav Sivka before the tournament. He went on to make top eight of this. He made a bold prediction to me that we would see all five ordeals in constructed decks of this tournament, and it looked like that basically wound up being the case, and then finally one of the breakout decks of the tournament didn't top eight, but had a great performance, featured limited bomb King Makar the Gold Cursed. Um, you know, there's a lot of decks that we're not seeing, a lot of block decks in standard because of the card pool there, but in block, you know, you can look at some of the powerful things you could do in a really good booster draft, form the basis of some of the more successful constructed decks at this tournament. All right, Randy, what was your first observation from the weekend? The future of card drawing is green. I mean, it's true in block right now. It's going to be true in standard. Like when Sphinx's Revelation rotates out of the format, you know, Detention Sphere goes with it, Supreme Verdict goes with it. What are the control decks going to look for card advantage? They're going to look to Eidolon of Blossoms. They're going to look to Corsair of Crufix. You know, Corsair of Crufix is very powerful. It's good at blocking. It's everything the control deck needs. It even is your card drawing engine. You made I mean, it an honorary blue card earlier in the weekend. Well, I mean, look, I'll draw cards from black cards as well. I mean, if, if <laughs> I got to pay life for them, that's fine. I don't care what color they are. I just want the extra cards. And yeah, it means they're going to be shuffling up for us next year. All right, let's take a look at Zach's next observation from the weekend. We've seen the future, Zach. Yeah, we've seen the future and it looks big. One of the things that we're take, uh, checking out over and over again were, you know, th this was a format of incremental advantage, but the way that people got the edge in their mid-range fights, the way they leveraged those extra lands from courses of Crufix, things like uh, the, the, you know, we called Gruel Ultimatum, uh, it was something of the great rebel basically make four two two satyr tokens. We were seeing that we rebel saw of the fallen gods. Rebel yeah. of the Fallen Gods. We've saw uh, silence the believers replicated the kill. We saw Pat Shape and Cast it killing three different tokens. We've seen Planeswalker Ultimates. You know, we've seen four different Planeswalker Ultimates fired in the feature match There's area. been a lot of 9-9 nine -nine Krakens in our feature match here. We had to dig through the binder to find those, <laughs> but they stayed out once they came out. Right, and even just your basic, you know, your Pelucranos, your Stormbreath Dragon, activated for monstrous. We've seen huge creatures over and over again here on the Sunday stage. I mean, this block format is about going large and going over the top. You know, we, <laughs> we thought that there was a Colossus of Akros in one of the decks. It turned out not to be there, but we we're like, this is a very reasonable card. Like, <laughs> this seems kind of hard to beat, you know? So I think there is a lot of big spells and big effects as the future of block and in standard. All right, Randy, what was your next observation from the weekend? Channel Fireball Pantheon. They had an amazing weekend. They're the best right now. They've been consistently putting up great performances. They broke the format in Theros. You know, a little bit of a hiccup, I guess, in Valencia. You know, they didn't actually put somebody into the top eight, but three in the top eight here, two more in the top 16, six more in the money. That's 11 of their 14 players finished in the money here, and all 14 of them got through to day two. Yeah, I asked Owen that earlier when I had him in the chair. I was chatting with him, and I said, how many guys day two? He's like, all. <laughs> yeah, all of them. Just 100%. He's like, just all. And what? then there were, there were something like, you know, 150 players on day two. You know, they're almost all in the money, 11 people in the money. You think about it, there may be, what, 5% of the field? If there's, you know, 14 out of 400, they're like 3 or 4% of the field. They're like 20% of the top of the standings. Yeah. Just absolutely insane. And they're doing this consistently. It's not like they just found one broken deck here. Two different decks in the top eight. 
you just you got to tip your cap to them. Yeah, 14 you know, they players. They nailed this tournament. 14 players, not a small team at all, and success across the entire team. Zach, what's your takeaway next? I mean, my takeaway has a lot more to do with uh, what cards we didn't see as opposed to the team performances that we saw. You've got some gods up on the screen. We saw a few of the gods, but we saw, we saw Perforos, Nylea, God of the Hunt, a little bit of Farika, God of Affliction being played today. But by and large, you did not see very many gods getting play. Even something like Perforos was actually highlighted in a deck that didn't feature many red permanents for the enchantment ability. You look at Standard, on the other hand, and cards like Perforos, cards like Thassa, uh, some of the, you know, Xenagos, the God version, not the Planeswalker version, are really, really powerful and standard. But that's not what we're seeing in this block format because, you know, things like Lifebane Zabi, Night Veil Spectre, Boros Reckoner, not legal in the format. So even though God's this really prominent cycle of mythic rares, just not what we saw at the block tournament today. I think we're going to have to wait back for standard to see these cards make a resurgence. All yeah, right. I really think getting more mana pips, getting more creatures with lots of mana pips helps them a lot. Right. All right, Randy, what was your next takeaway? A Korean. We have not seen South Koreans doing well at premier level events. I think there was, you know, I know there was, there was one Grand Prix top eight back, at, you know, a couple of years ago, but Nam Sung Wook, he won Grand Prix Melbourne, right? He top eighted in Beijing. It says Pro Tour top eight there. It's now a top four and counting for him. This guy has absolutely put South Korea on the map. I mean, uh, Park Shin Young, who won Minneapolis last weekend, all of a sudden, these two Koreans have joined forces with the NTG Mint. And, you know, we got a new country we're going to have to keep an eye on. I think that Nam Sung Wook is going to be at Worlds now. This is more of a prediction than it's not like he's clinched it. Well, he's got one way to clinch it. He's two wins from clinching it. He is. I think he's going to get there either way. So. It's going to be, it's just an interesting development that in sort of the world. That is very of, interesting and something to keep an eye on in a very strong gamer communities in South Korea. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. So if they pick up magic. Yeah, legendary for eSports. Exactly. All right, Zach, Zach what's your next uh, takeaway? My next takeaway is a piece of advice, and uh, it's cast Supreme Verdict. I think we're going to see a lot of people trying to port some of these block decks over <laughs> into Standard. One of the reasons that we saw a bunch of decks do well is because, as we said over and over and over again, there's no unconditional sweeper in the format. You've got Sylvan Karyatid, kind of the far seek of the format, except it's a creature. It dies to Supreme Verdict. Prognostic Sphinx, one of the key reasons for Team uh, Channel Fireball Pantheon success, dies horribly to Supreme Verdict. Stanislav Sivka's deck, we saw, you know, essentially boat tokens would launch the fleet making 1-1 one, one soldiers. Crow and Crusader making a bunch of little 1-1 one, one soldiers. Go as wide as you want to get around those courses of Krufix. All dies to Supreme Verdict. I think what we're going to see if uh, people try to brew up some new decks with these, uh, with these cards from this tournament, got to get hit by a lot of Wrath Effects. Right, we'll keep an eye on the Wrath Effects. Randy, what was your next takeaway? Uh, another prediction for you. Jared Betcher's winning Rookie of the Year. Jared Betcher, think about this. So he top eights Grand Prix DC, loses to Owen Turtenwald in the finals, right? That qualifies him for, the, for Pro Tour Valencia. That was his first Pro Tour, finished ninth, right? Put up another Grand Prix top eight. That qualified him for here. Put up a, a top eight in Cincinnati in between. The kid has played two Pro Tours lifetime. This was the worst Pro Tour performance he's ever had. <laughs> of his career, he finished 10th. I mean, I guess we know he's going to finish 11th in Portland. Is that now the pattern that he's set up? <laughs> Maybe he'll go back the other direction and yeah, finish. And, and he, was leading, he was leading Rookie of the Year by, you know, four or five points coming into this. He gets 15 pro points for that top 16, for that 10th place finish. So just huge lead, you know, not mathematically insurmountable, but he's going to win that title, and that means we're going to see him at Worlds, too. Wow, that's fantastic. Good for Jared. Last one for you, Zach. My final uh, takeaway is a little bit more of a reflection. And that reflection is that magic has grown up. Now, you wouldn't necessarily know that by looking at Patrick the Innovator Chapin's picture right there. <laughs> but uh, what we saw in the quarterfinals, Jamie Park, Patrick Chapin, two players who have top eighted events in the 90s, in the 2000s, and in the 2010s, playing magic against one another. I bring up Nam Sung Wook, too, because I remember, you know, I remember when it was a big deal when Canada got uh, the World Championship team title mm -hmm. for the first time. We saw the rise of Canada. Then we saw the rise of Europe. In the early 2000s, we saw the 
rise of Japan. Then finally, in the later 2000s, we saw kind of the resurgence of America. What we haven't seen and what you alluded to, Randy, was the rest of Asia coming alive. But with uh, Chinese Taipei winning the World Magic Cup a couple of years ago, powerful performances from uh, Li Shi Chen, mm -hmm. and now Nam Sung Wook making it back to back uh, for Team MTG Mint, I think we've seen the rest of Asia finally catch up with that initial Japanese resurgence to see powerful, powerful teams from all over the world at the Pro Tour stage, really representing kind of a, kind of a maturity for upper level competitive magic. It's just uh, reminding me how far this game has come over the last two decades. What about for you, Randy? What was your last uh, observation? A little lighter. I had to share some of the crazy things I saw going on. Prognostic Sphinx in the bug control deck. We know it's a it's a hugely impactful creature. It's had a lot of impact in a lot of matches. And you know, it's hard to deal with it. You can't Elspeth it. There's no Supreme Verdict to kill it. So what are you going to do? Well, one tech, the 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 players from Denmark who played the bug control deck, they knew they were going to be in Prognostic Sphinx battles. This includes Lars Dahm, by the way, the Magic Online winner. And they played Savage Surge in the sideboard. <laughs> so you block my Sphinx with your Sphinx. You thought I just wanted the Scry Triggers, but no, 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 Savage Surge. I'm gonna win in combat. Or you attack through my tap Sphinx, untap, block, kill your Sphinx. Pretty crazy the lens people will go to. And then even Yuya Watanabe, he took his Naya colored deck, he splashed black mana for worst fears. Worst fears, take control of your opponent's turn. You know, if they have Prognostic Sphinx in play, I think it needs Hexproof. I think it needs Hexproof again. You know what? I think you're going to discard your entire hand Five to your Prognostic Six. <laughs> yeah, he called his deck Naya Slaver for, for the Mind Slaver effect. And it. that was crucial in him and giving getting him an edge against those Prognostic Sphinx Maybe decks. we'll see next leveling in the form of Colossal <laughs> Heroics over the, uh, <laughs> over the Savage Search. All right. We're almost time to go. It's almost ready to go down to the semifinal future match. Let's take a look at our matchup here. We have Josh utter Layton versus Patrick Chapin. Let's take a look at Josh. He's currently ranked 13th on our top 25 pro rankings. Team Channel Fireball, 146,000. Platinum Pro from last year. He, I believe, is going to be Platinum now going into the next year, Randy. Does that sound right to yeah, you? Yeah, no, I think he's clinched it now. I think he has, too. Uh, with this top eight and now, of course, top four moving forward. He's playing the bug control deck that Team Channel Fireball brought to this list. He's, he described it as a collection of the best cards in the format. Yeah, certainly with a, with a Courser and Karyatid mana base with 12 temples, you kind of get to pick three colors and then pick the good cards you want from those colors. So bug was definitely the choice. Blue, the reason to choose blue is the Sphinx we've been talking about. So that's the way Channel Fireball went with that deck list. And yeah, it's... It's kind of your classic control deck, just without the f more familiar uh, card drawing cards. Yeah, you know, I had a chance to chat with Josh recently uh, backstage here a little bit, and he told me some pretty interesting things. He said, I asked him, I said, well, what did you do? You know, did you, did you do a bunch of testing beforehand, you know, last night and today, and, and what's been going? He's like, oh, I, he's like, I played some games against Webb, you know, which is just kind of his comfort zone. Maybe they noted a few things here and there, but he said when he starts off the tournament, Sometimes it'll take him a match to kind of get into the groove, but he says the further it goes, the more dialed in he gets. You know how some people get frazzled or get tired? He said, I, can, I, he said, I think I could play Magic for 24 hours straight once I get focused like that. Yes. And it's true, he says he just, he doesn't see or think about other things. He's completely able to block everything out and dial in, and that's what he's gonna be looking to do here. He did not seem nervous or anything about getting tired or, or facing any fatigue or nervousness issues at all. I think he's gonna be super dialed in. Let's take a look at his opponent, somebody else who, if you look at his hands when he plays, you might think he's nervous because they shake around a little, but I don't think he's actually nervous at all. Patrick Chapin, number 13 currently on the top 25 pro rankings. Hall of Famer, million lifetime pro points. He's got 253, and uh, this is this, this is his fifth top eight, right, yes. Randy? So here he is, three Grand three Grand Prix top eights, five Pro Tour top eights, a bit of a Pro Tour specialist there out of 45 Pro Tours played. Of course, he's in the Hall of Fame, and he's part of that class that you mentioned a minute ago, Zach, of sort of the grown-up class that have grown up with Magic. Yeah, exactly, and, and, and he's one of the best deck builders of all time. I think it's hard to argue. He's playing an amazing deck here. We haven't really seen, a, we've seen a lot of junk constellation decks, that's green, black, white decks. We haven't seen a lot of junk, just creature decks. And that's exactly what Patrick's playing, a deck designed largely to prey upon the style of decks that Josh is going to be playing this weekend. And uh, truly uh, innovative, like we've said, a big moment for Patrick with that fifth top eight, placing him into the list of really Magic's all-time greats. 
All right, well, he wants to further that, <laughs> further his position on that list. He's in the semifinals versus Josh Utter Layton, and the players are ready to go. Let's send it down to Rich Hagen, BDM, and Luis Scott Vargas, who await in the booth.